with Elena Johnson, author of Possession. We're going to talk a lot about teen lit today. When did you first fall in love with teen literature? Um, that's kind of a hard question because when I was a teenager, there was really nothing for teenagers to read. The thing that I realized, oh, there's like a teen genre, was Twilight. And my husband actually read Twilight first. And he goes, you need to read this book and tell me if it's good or not because I don't really like it and you need to tell me. And we'd read, you know, he teaches sixth grade, so we read a lot of middle, middle grade, Harry Potter, things like that. But I wasn't reading Teen Lit. I just wasn't. So I read Twilight and I was like, yeah, this is, I like this. And he's like, oh, I can't believe you like that. But I really liked it. And so from there I was like, oh my heck, there's like all kinds of books for teens. And that was about the time I turned 30. So just about last five years or so is when I've really been reading a lot of YA literature and things like that. And I didn't really know it existed before then. And I mean, what is it about teen literature that really grabbed you? What was it about Twilight or any of the other books that really drew you in? What I really like about teen lit is the emotion. I also like the idea of firsts, you know, first love or first crush or first kiss or first experience cliff diving or whatever. I like stuff like that. And so it sort of makes me feel like I might still have firsts in my life, if that that's, makes sense. That's really cool. And you know what? I think there's a little bit of an angsty teen in all of us. So Yes, there better be. <laughs> Okay, so I think that one of the things about YA literature or teen literature that's super great is pacing. Typically, YA novels are pretty fast-paced. There's a lot of things going on and a lot of things that you've got to keep track of, and it's one thing after another. I think that sometimes adult novels are not quite as fast-paced that way. So if you're maybe struggling with that and you're writing or you're looking for a way to maybe uh, find some way to do that without having to read a craft book, because I'm sort of anti-craft books, I'll admit it, I would, you know, consider picking up a YA novel. I think another thing about YA novels that are super great is characterization. Um, typically, YA readers won't stick around with you for a very long time to find out all about a character. And so you really have to be able to characterize a person with just a few words or in one scene that will really make your readers want to stay with them for a whole book. Because they might not stay with you very long if you don't do that. And that's a little bit different, I think, from adult literature or more literary uh, genres. Because typically we're, we know that those are going to be a little bit longer and will stick with you because we love the quality of the writing or something like that. But for YA stuff, we're really looking to fall in love with a character and then have bad things happen to them so that they can get out of those bad things. So those are the two things that I would say if you're looking to stretch yourself in pacing and plotting and, and characterizing your characters succinctly, you should definitely pick up a YA novel. bit about Possession. What was your process like writing that book? Possession was the third novel that I had written and I had just finished Scott Westerfeld's Uglies and I loved that book. I loved that whole series and I thought I want to write a book like that. But I didn't really know what that was so I googled it and I figured out that it was like this futuristic post-apocalyptic dystopian type of society. And so it was April. It was April 2008 and I knew I had spring break coming up and I wanted to do a lot of writing. So I had a whole week off plus the weekends before that was about, you know, nine or ten days. So I sat down at the beginning of spring break in April 2008 and I wrote Possession just beginning to end. I don't really plot or think about what's coming next. I sort of just crack my knuckles and go for it. Oh my gosh. So it sounds like when it comes to the sort of process of writing, you're more of what they call a pantser than a plotter. Is there a method to the madness or do you just wing it? Well, with Possession, I totally just winged it. And it is my favorite thing to do to just wing the zero draft. I, that is what I love about writing. That is what excites me about writing. It's why I sit down to write, is to discover the story. I love the discovery writing. I will say that now I am much more structured. I do think about the beginning, the end, the middle. I think about the setting. I think about what characters might come into play. And I might type myself, you know, 500 to 1,000 words of brainstorming. It's just brainstorming. And then I start writing. Um, with Possession, I didn't do that. And so I had quite the road of revision ahead of me. 
And so I did a lot of revision. I let it sit for a little bit, but that summer I had two or three readers read it and played around with a little bit more revision. And I was querying another book, so possession wasn't really on my radar at the time. But then when I decided to get serious about entering it into the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award contest, I thought, you got to revise this thing. And so I really did pull the whole thing apart and keep some things and take some things out and rewrite sections. My revision process is very intense. It takes me many layers, many times to to get through that. I'm getting better at it, so I'm a little bit faster now, but with Possession, it took me about a year before I felt like this novel is ready for, you know, real people to look at. So when you revise, you talked about layers. Is there like a specific order of layers? Like, do you go through and just do character one time, or do you kind of juggle like all the balls in the air for every single draft? I definitely do not juggle all the balls in the air. I pick several things, sometimes maybe one thing or two things, sometimes four or five, depending on what I think I can do, and work on those only for that layer. The first layer is always fixing the plot. I have at least, you know, ten comment bubbles to myself. And so the first thing I do in my first round of revision to take my zero draft to a first draft is address all the comment bubbles that are in my document, the notes that I've left for myself you need to fix this, find a spot for this conversation, blah, 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 blah. I do all that first. And then I print my document after that, all 350, however many pages it is. I have to do a whole pass on the timeline. <laughs> And maybe some people are really good about keeping track about what day their books start and how many days go by and what people do. And I have no idea. I'm just like, the next morning, the next morning, the next morning. And then when I want to reference like an email that somebody got, I really have no idea when they got it. I just know they got it before. So I have to do a whole pass on timeline. And is this time matching up with this time? And it was especially hard in Surrender because Surrender is dual narrated. And so... And at one point, one of the main characters leaves the city, and he's gone for a specified numbers of, number of days, and then he comes back. And I need this storyline to match up with that one, and it was, I had to do a whole pass on timeline. And so <laughs> I do several rounds like that myself, um, focusing on big things first, plot, character, setting, and all of that stuff. And then I focus on, am I using the senses? Do I have a smell here? What else can I do to make this more interesting? Those kinds of things until I, I feel like I'm finished and then I pass it off to either my agent who's very editorial or you know my beta readers and say rip this apart. And basically I wanted to do two things with the world. I wanted it to have cool tech. So I was always thinking of trying coming up with cool things that technology could do. And so they have implants and they can com they can compose messages in their brain and things like that. I wanted there to be cool tech. And I wanted there to be a forbidden boundary. And so um, Vi is sort of encapsulated in the good grounds and she's never left. And that was it. That was it for the world when I started writing. I sort of went from there and the world sort of evolved into there is this very controlled society, but right next to it, not that far away, there's a society that's not as controlled. And so I wanted to explore the difference between those two um, for the good grounds and the badlands and sort of see how Vi would feel about having um, lived in both places or experienced both things. I don't know if you've read Possession, so I won't tell you exactly how it ends, but let's just say that it doesn't end well. It is a dystopian book, and I did write it as a standalone novel. But then as we started exploring more possibilities for my second book, we thought, well, let's do another possession book. I must have tried, like, ten different narrators, and nothing was working, and I finally just thought, I can't do a narrating character that is related in any way to possession. So I just totally abandoned all idea of using a possession character, and I created two new characters. Uh, Gunnar Jameson and Rain Hightower, and they both narrate in the book. They live in Freedom, which is the capital of the association. They live in the lion's den. They live where Jack tells Vi, we don't want to go there. And so I thought, okay, I have to make this world scary. It has to be high tech, and it has. To, I have to have somewhere in this city where we find out why the world is the way it is. And so it was from working through the setting 
then I found out more about my world. And I think it's fun to see the world and see other characters and see, you know, the strictness of the rules through more than one person. Um, in Possession, we only get Vi, and she's very angry. In Surrender, we have Gun and Rain, and Gun is sort of just like, I'm okay with this. And Rain is the director's daughter, so she's sort of, you know, not okay with it, but okay with it at the same time. So it's just an interesting, it was an interesting experiment to realize that not everyone is as angry as Vi, and that they all have opinions about their world as well. So it was really fun to write, and I, re I really hope that readers will enjoy it. Okay, so I think that some of the best advice that I can give you in a class like this is that I think every writer owes it to themselves to figure out the best way that they work and that they write. And the best way that you do that is you write a lot and you try different things and new things for different books. So um, I am a self-proclaimed pantser. I, my favorite thing to do is to sit down and just go for it. Just write and not think a whole lot about where I'm going or plotting or anything like that. I have outlined, and it was sort of torture for me, but I did outline Surrender. My agent out made me outline it so that we could sell it to the publisher. And it took me three months to outline Surrender. <laughs> and like working every day on it and it was like 20 pages that's the hardest I've worked on 20 pages in my life and then I wrote the book in 25 days and I think that I often think I shouldn't have done that I wasted three months of my life but I didn't there is no waste when you're writing um, every word you write and every method you try is something that you're adding to your arsenal of tools that you know how to do. And um, I think I crippled myself early on when I first started writing because I read so many blogs where people talked about, oh, you have to outline, you have to know Act 1, you have to know Act 2, you have to know Act 3, I didn't even know what they were talking about. And then, so I didn't write for a long time because I thought, I'm doing it wrong. And so my best advice to you is that there, remember, there is no wrong way but that you do owe it to yourself to figure out what way you work best. And I have the confidence now that I've tried enough things and I'm open, I have an open mind to enough different methods that I will use what's going to work best for me and then I just don't worry about what anybody else says. <laughs> because it can really cripple you if you let it. And so that's one piece of advice is to try lots of different things and find out what works best for you. And my other best piece of advice, I'm sure you've heard it lots of times, is to write. Write more, write more, write more. You, what are you working on? What's your next big project? It's a sci-fi thriller that has to do with time travel. So I'm really excited about that, and it was really difficult to wrap my head around the time travel. I think I'm a little bit more brain dead now than I used to be. And the timeline problem that I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of timeline problems in the time travel novel. I just finished it, so it needs a lot of editing. You never know if your work's getting it published or not, but for me, it's about the love of writing. It's the love of sitting down and being like, I created this story. So for me, that, that's been enough. And even the books I write now, even though I am published, and the goal is to publish more books, the books I write, if they don't make it to publication, I still love writing them. It's all practice words, and it all helps me get better for the books that will be published. I'm looking forward to seeing your, your next book. Awesome. Thanks for having me.